emerging. We are talking about equality. We are talking about de-dollarizing trade. We are talking about foreign policy, non-interference. This idea that Americans want us to think the way they want us to think, they want they want us to behave they want the, the way they want us to behave to do things in their in manner and style to choose for us who our enemies and friends are we must tell them no you cannot choose for us you cannot tell us what to do we are human beings we know what we want you cannot choose our friend for us you cannot choose our enemies for us we choose what we want to do and we relate with you from a position of mutual respect why do they do that military power all these things you see is because america knows europe knows that they can bomb us to smithereens using their nuclear power that is why they are strong because of their military power that is why the american ambassador in any country feels so confident because they can bring a warship on the coast of Mombasa and release the tomahawks against us. So we must be strong. If you are weak, even your diplomacy is weak. Your everything is weak. You will be tolerated, but you will not be respected. Africa must lift herself so that she is respected, not tolerated, and not treated like a child in diapers whose diapers are changed at will, even when they are not soiled. The Pan-African movement is an old movement, and one sees Pan-Africanism in its embryonic stages during the lives of people like wronged many years, and are, they continue to wrong us. One of the things that I and others are working on right now is reparation. And what makes me happy is that in the recent past, I've seen the French president uh, give apologize for colonization and slavery. I've seen the Dutch have also apologized. The Belgians have apologized. I'm waiting for the British to apologize properly. I hope the Spaniards will do so, the Portuguese will do so, the Americans will do so. And all these debts that we, they claim we owe them, the first step towards reparation is that all debts owed by African countries will be cancelled completely. That is part of the reparation. Once they atone for their sins, then we will know that they mean well. And then we must begin to grow our own capacity to do things. We must make our mobile phones. We must make our computers and laptops. We must make our aeroplanes. We must make our own cars. We must make our own medical equipment. We must feed ourselves. We must make our furniture so that there is competition. You see what is happening in Europe and America. They are, the Europeans are making Airbus. The Americans are making Boeing. The Chinese are making their own plane. The Brazilians are making Embraer. So we must not allow slavery and colonization to be a permanent excuse. We are not the only people who are enslaved or colonized. The Indians were, they are doing good work now. The Chinese were harassed by the Japanese many times as were the South Koreans, and they are now doing great things. Singapore was colonized, Brazil was colonized. So that is no longer an excuse, we cannot continue to complain. We must now begin to act and act in a proper manner. And if we do so, then we will compete because the world is about competition. Nobody is going to give you anything on a silver platter. The sooner we realize that, the safer we are. As they would say in the United States of America, it's time for Africa to smell the coffee. Therefore, when they emerged, they started having, when they were rebuilding Europe after the World War II, America now became a major industrial power. And why were then they interested in Africa? Once again, it is because of resources. There is nothing that interests the world in Africa other than strategic interests, which are resources, which are natural resources. And the politics is important to them, and political domination is important to them because it helps them access these resources. You'll see, for example, in the 1970s, under the Lomé Convention, the Europeans entered into an arrangement with the Africans. 
for purposes of accessing their markets and their produce. You saw that during the Cotonou Agreement. You know, you've seen that through the AGOA, Africa Growth Opportunity Act, which gives uh, countries preferential treatment. And these are all schemes which are designed by these powers for that purpose. We now have new entrants into the arena, China, which is gobbling anything on sight. China's appetite for resources is insatiable. And it's not only in Africa, you see it in Latin America, but Africa is the place. Look at what they are doing in Congo, how they are, the timber they are getting from Congo and all the natural resources. So Africa finds herself in a place where her resources make her very attractive and she is continuing, we, continuing to be a, a, a supplier of raw materials. So that the relationship between Africa and the rest of the world is an unequal relationship. Is like the relationship between the horse and the rider, Africa being the horse and the riders being China, the United States of America, Turkey, India, Russia sometimes, and all these countries. That must change if Africa is to grow. So that when we talk about trade, it is trade. It is only people who are equals that can engage in proper trade, particularly when you are talking about trade at a national and continental level. So we are attractive and there is a new scramble for Africa and that scramble is for Africa's resources. When you see military bases being stationed in Africa is to control those resources and to ensure that we are, they are the only ones who have a hand in it. And you can see how Djibouti, for example, has become the home of many bases, whether it's Chinese, Americans, and whether it's uh, uh, Russians or Chinese, all these are in Djibouti, and now they are building some bases in Barbara, in uh, Somaliland, they have bases in Ghana, rather not in Ghana, but they have a military presence in Ghana. The British have a military presence here in Kenya. They have a military presence in uh, different parts, in Somalia, in Sudan in the Sahelian region, all because of resources. Yeah, that is a wonderful and powerful words. But today I want to uh, bring you a lesson from uh, these hands. Uh, these are found many in our rural areas. Uh, today I, I take a time to observe uh, their lives. Uh, of course, their presence uh, so when uh, it is learning, you can phone them. But I try to learn something from these ants. So despite that uh, their size individually is small, but these ants are very dangerous. They can defeat snake, large insects. Even human being cannot survive in these ants. So you can see how uh, through collective efforts, they can attack and win the battle. So, observing ants at work can teach us a valuable lesson about the importance of collaboration, communication, and the division of labor in achieving common goals. We, the people of Africa, we are divided, we are looks weak, but if we come together, collaborating, communicating, and divide labors to achieve a certain goal we can achieve. It, this it highlights the idea that even seeming insignificant, contributions can be vital to the success of a group. And demonstrate resilience and adaptability in the face of challenges. They are able to quickly, to quickly respond to, ch to changes in their environment and work together to find solutions, showing the importance of flexibility and the problem-solving skills. You know, if you disturb these uh, ants, after a certain time, you will see they come together again. Those who are soldier ants will move around to make sure that those who are carrying uh, food, uh, eggs, are protected. 
that is how these ants are living so the lesson from ant life underscores the significance of unity diligence and adaptability in achieving collective success i have come with this idea uh, to share because you know we the people of africa in many areas nowadays we are not working together we are not uh, united so we have in the previous our communities are coming together working together but this time around africans we are not coming together so i have decided to come with this uh, example the little example to demonstrate how we the people of africa we can maybe you can do something toward unity working together so that we can we can achieve a uh, collective success but all in all my dear brothers and sisters what i want to uh, demonstrate is the importance of unity unity is very important for all of us africa to survive on we need to come together we need this unity